This is episode number 25 of the Expert Table Tennis Podcast. My name is Ben Larkham and my guest on the show today is England's Danny Reid. Now, Danny is the England number five behind Paul, Liam, Andrew Bagley and Sam Walker. He is ranked just outside the top 200 in the world. And for this season, he's set himself the goal of trying to break into the top 100 players, which is something that obviously I'm really interested in. In many ways, it's almost like he's doing his own expert in a year challenge. He's trying to really up his training, focus completely on table tennis and see if he can transform himself in the space of a season from a top 200 player into a top 100 player. And if he does that, he's going to be able to continue competing at a high level and make a real career out of the sport. So really interesting interview. Let's get straight into it with England's Danny Reid. Joining me on the show today is England's Daniel Reid. Hi, Dan. Hi, Ben. Hi, how are you doing? Good, thanks. It's great to have you on the show. Now, you're out in Austria at the moment, aren't you? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Training at the Werner Lager Academy. Yes. Cool, brilliant. Well, the reason I, I got you on the show was that about a month or so ago, I, I was reading a Table Tennis England article that where you'd done an interview, and you said this at the end of the article, and I'm just going to read it out. You said... I decided I'd focus on table tennis this year to give myself the chance to practice and put in the hours and see what happens. Whether I further my studies or go into a job depends on my performances and where I can get to. If you can get into the top 100, then you can support yourself. It's worth a year to go for it. It would take a special season, but I've got nothing to lose. And that idea of giving it a year and kind of really going for it for a year is something that obviously I'm really interested in. I did the expert in a year challenge with Sam and then... Back on episode 10, I actually spoke to Rory Scott about his challenge to get into the top 100 uh, in England. And I guess that's that's very similar to what you're doing. Obviously, you're doing it at the next level, aren't you? Your aim is to get into the into the top 100 in the world. Yeah, no, definitely. It's, a, it's all connected, I think. And it's just the idea of of no matter what level you are, really setting yourself a, a goal that's it's not going to be an easy goal for you, is it? It's kind of pushing the boundaries, but at the same time, you believe that it's possible if you spend a whole year really going for it and putting the work in. Yeah, definitely. I think it's definitely a challenge, but the way Table Tennis England's going and developing and some of the performances from the team has sort of given me a lot of confidence and inspired me as well. And I think it's it's good that we feel that that's a possibility and that's where we the players from England should be trying to get to. Yeah, because I guess we've got Paul and Liam who are both at about 50 and then uh, yourself, Sam and Andrew Bagley, I guess, are all pushing to to get into that top 100 and kind of fighting each other for that third spot in the team, aren't you? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I would say Andrew is obviously the number three at the moment and it's like it's good competition between us. We're all between, between about 150 and I'm about 217 in the world at the moment. So Sam's about inside the top 200 so I think it's good competition and I think that really pushes everybody on and it's a good thing and I think at any level if you have a competition like that it pushes you to sort of to the highest level pushes yourself to perform to the best you can yeah definitely like it's it's really important to have to be surrounded by other players that are all kind of striving towards the same goals and you can kind of you can compete against each other but also at the same time if Sam and, and Andrew are improving, then you're going to be kind of playing against better players. So it kind of, it all, it's just a big cycle, isn't it? Will? It's all kind of pushing everyone else forwards. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's a philosophy that's just developed over the last year or so. And I think in the past, it hasn't been like that in England so much. And I think we've learned that it's actually good to have a large squad or competition and good to give everybody opportunities because it allows everybody to push each other. So the people at the yeah. top never relax and the people at the bottom feel that if they work hard and do all of these high level things that I'm sure we'll talk about, then you you have an opportunity to get there as well instead of cutting it off and not giving those opportunities to players. So I think it's a, there's been a lot of good changes in the, the philosophy in England. Brilliant. Sounds great. Well, we're going to definitely talk about that later. What I'd like to to jump into first is just to... To go back to your childhood, I know that you started playing at the age of 10, which, I mean, 10 is not old, but it could be considered quite a late start for players that go on to reach the international level. I know that Paul and, and Darius would have been playing quite a bit younger than 10, wouldn't they? So 
How did you manage to start at 10 and then make it into the England team relatively quickly within the next two or three years? Yeah, I would, I would call it sort of lucky circumstances, really. Um, similar to what sort of Matthew Side said in his book, Bounce, I would say, because was, I was at a primary school club that fed into Ormsby Table Tennis Club, which was in a really good position at the time with a lot of good players. And they, they came to do an exhibition at the school. And so Paul was actually part of the exhibition at my primary school. And they were looking for players. And I sort of got scout, scouted into the squad. And Carol Moore, the coach at the time, was just really pushing the group hard. And the, I sort of got into a really good group of players. There was people like older players like Stephen Bailey, Danny Welsh, Andy Wilson, Jonathan Durham, Nicky Skip. And obviously Paul... And his brother Bryn was sort of the best at the time, both playing for England. So it was just a really good time and everybody was training hard and we would put in a lot of hours and Carol was really motivated to push us. And so, yeah, I just sort of got fast tracked into being practicing at a very high level and, and it just became normal. Yeah. So you say that, I mean, you mentioned bounce, you see that as almost being like kind of a situational thing you found yourself in the right place at the right time with a good coach good club a good group of players it just happened that that was all there at, at the perfect age for you yeah definitely I think I was obviously I didn't didn't know that at the time it just happened but when I look back the circumstances really helped me and to have like an England coach as the head coach at a club was really lucky in England and there weren't many good clubs at that time practicing on that level um, mm. and Carol really pushed me a lot and she she saw potential in me, but she realised that I had to put in extra hours to catch up with the the people behind me. But I think going yeah. back to the thing we mentioned about having that competition, the group was really, there was a lot of competition in the group and we, there was quite a lot of players, seven or eight players on a similar level, all pushing each other. So there was there was sort of the, the elite, you could see that Paul was going to be really good and his brother Bryn was really good. So you sort of had that to follow, but you also had a group of players that were all working hard and you'd play top table on a night and you'd all be winning and losing and things like that. So you had to practice hard, otherwise you weren't improving and people around you were. So it just, it just yeah. naturally created a really good environment and culture. Now, how much were you practicing as a 10 or 11 year old at Ormsby? Well, I mean, it was, I think around that time, 10, 11, it was more slowly building up so Carol would just coach me one-to-one -one sometimes and then we sort of as a family realized that I would have to put in a lot more commitment and Carol Mench explained how much training it would be and then I started to train three or four times a week in Ormsby um, but it, it quickly picked up you know and I was doing extra practice a lot of the time and even in like school lunch hours Carol would come and do one-to-ones with me um, as a as a volunteer, so Carol's been a massive influence and helped me a lot, really. And I think one to ones really accelerate your development as a kid because you're working on specific details, and it just over a short an hour, you're just doing a load of the same technique, and it really grooves in the right technique, and you develop very quickly. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of hours, I was probably doing about. 20 hours a week, I think, from a young age. I mean, weekends, any chance we got a free weekend without tournaments, we would practice both days. So That's a lot, isn't it? That's an awful lot of hours for a, for a kid so young. Were, were you, that was very much, you were the one that wanted to do that, weren't you? I don't think, you've got brothers and sisters, but th they didn't play table tennis, did they? No, I mean, my, my brother played a lot of football. I mean, I always played a lot of football and we played tennis. We did loads of different sports. Um, and he tried table tennis, but didn't really like the individual aspect of it. And I, I much more like the sort of focus and individual time you have to spend. And you sort of have to be quite an introvert in terms of spending time working on small details a lot. And uh, so, yeah, it was more, I, I was just lucky to get into a high level environment very quickly. So it's just, and, and I think to have England players around you. Because my goal was always to play for England because, well, that was just always, always my goal. And I realised table tennis was the best chance to do that. I think football yeah. is a lot more difficult. And uh, I was the captain of my local town, but 
I was never physically anywhere near what, especially scouting at the time, they they wouldn't take players that was small and skinny, <laughs> basically. So, okay, so even from a young age, you always wanted to like play for England or represent your country in something. You wanted to be really good at something. Yes, definitely. Yeah, definitely. That was that was my clear. I had a clear goal like that, definitely. Yeah. And that, okay, good. that's quite rare in like a, a ten or eleven year old, isn't it? Most of them aren't really thinking like that. True. Yeah, I think I was very. I think because I saw it in Ormsby because they were England players that showed me that, and that's why I, from a young age, wanted to play for England. It's like that inspiration. I think for kids to get that and see that it's possible is is really important and really helps them a lot. And I benefited a lot from having that vision from a young age. And um, yeah, it's just it's weird because it just happened. You know, I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. I just never didn't expect it to be possible. or wasn't sure if it would be possible. But yeah. if you have people around you that believe in you, and you also see a way, you know, you see the different levels in a group of players. It seems a lot more possible. I think the challenge is when you see like a massive goal and and nothing in between. And I think that's why it's important to break down the goals and do it one step at a time. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I I was flicking through your ranking history today, and and clearly all the work you were putting in, like it paid off very quickly. You were you represented England as as a cadet, and then you went on. You you won the European team with with the juniors is that is that right yeah that was probably the, oh, definitely the highlight of my junior career so that was Paul Darius Knight uh, me and David Meads so yeah I mean I was a strong number three in that team so it was a, I was really lucky to be in a very good team so Paul was number one in Europe at the time and Darius was number four so I was but I went in and only lost one out of all my matches as the number three so it was a that was a. It was also a lucky time to play for England, and like, it was just it was just a brilliant experience, really, to be in, to be involved in that and to win something so, so big like that at such a young age, or when my level wasn't really the best in Europe. It was a uh, really inspired me as well. Now that was two thousand and seven, so go eight years ago now, and then you you then went on from there into the seniors. I mean, you you played for all sorts of different clubs around Europe, didn't you? Yeah, I have. Um, I had a great club. The club I'm playing for now at the moment in Odense in Denmark. Um, that was my first experience of international sort of traveling to a club. And they were a really nice, friendly club. And I think it was a great, it was Steen Kist Hansen at the time, the, the, the head of English table tennis, the, the director, yeah. who organized that for me because he was Danish. And I think that was great to go out into Europe and see a league and see what the level's like and sort of realise that you've got a... I mean, I'd I'd seen junior international table tennis, but once you see senior international table tennis, you realise there's a long way to go. And it's a big... It's Even from from junior to senior, it's a massive step up. And it's very tough, I think, for junior players going into the senior game. You sort of go back to the bottom of the pile and have to start again a lot of the time. So, yeah, I played in the Danish club and then I, I went to the third league in Germany and played for Cologne and then moved up to the second division where we actually won the second division in Germany. Uh, and then I played for Falkenberg in Sweden where my highlight was probably beating Baldner. <laughs> 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 and now I'm back to playing for a Danish club. So it's, yeah, it's been some great experiences. Yeah, and throughout that time, you've been a very solid member of the England men's team, haven't you? You've done the Commonwealth Games and the the World Championships, European Championships, all of that stuff. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's been it's amazing to think that I set a goal to play for England and I've managed to do it and play for the senior team. Uh, I also think I was lucky in terms of at the time they were looking to develop young players, so I was in a very young England senior team when I got in. I think around 17, 18. Yeah. And it was also fun like that, you know, because we were a young team with Paul Darius, um, Gavin Evans, uh, there was Andrew Rush and people like that were around still, and Andrew Bagley, obviously. Um, but yeah, I've been very lucky. I've played seven world championships, eight European championships. So it's sort of been 10 years of being in that environment, which has been, yeah, what I, what I aimed for. So it's been great. I mean, obviously the highlights are the Commonwealth Games. 
And I think because we get that exposure and we don't often get the credit in table tennis because it's quite a, it's not the most um, covered in media. So yeah, to be involved in a game is really amazing. And uh, that's definitely the highlight of my career was Glasgow. Yeah. Okay. And then, so let's think last year, I know you didn't, you didn't play internationally because you were, you were studying for your, um, your final year, uh, psychology at Sheffield Hallam. That's right. Is it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So when did you, when did you actually start that? Was that kind of a three year course? Yeah, I, I did it full time because I had contact with Sheffield Hallam through the sport because TAS, my TAS hub was there because when the, okay. the national center was in Sheffield as well. So I knew a lot of people in the sport department. Dave Hembra, who still works with Table Tennis England, actually. And uh, <clears throat> so I met with the uni and asked them if my commitments abroad and internationally would allow me to do the degree. And I sort of had to convince them a bit <laughs> that I would do the, have time to do the work. Cause I, yeah, because you, you, you weren't living in Sheffield, were you, at the time? You were still living abroad? Yes, exactly. So I was... So my first year was living in Sweden, playing for Falkenberg. Yeah. So, I mean, because it's not a practical course, it's a lot of reading and uh, writing stuff. So it's not like a science where you have to be in labs and things. So I was able to do a lot of the work while I was away. And I think that was good. It was psychology. So I was still putting a lot of hours in, but I was just, I would train in Sweden most of the time and do the work there and then come back every now and again to sort of catch up with teachers and make sure that everything's right and come back for assessments and stuff. So it was a very unusual way to do it, really. And it was quite challenging. What, so what led you to, to make the choice to go back to university and, and study for a degree? So, I mean, my main goal... So we had the National Centre in Sheffield. So my main goal was obviously to try and get in the Olympic team for London 2012 because we had a guaranteed team because we were the home nation. So yeah. my goal was to try to get to number three in Great Britain. Um, and I, ob- I obviously didn't make, yeah, didn't achieve that. I mean, it was quite a tough goal. Um, I'm still trying, <laughs> still trying to get to number three for the next, the next year as well. But um, yeah, so all my commitment was up towards that and I felt it was worth it and uh, to go for that. It was a good goal to have. And after I didn't achieve that, I think I felt that, I'd been lacking because all through my career up until getting into senior table tennis, I'd had um, studying combined with playing as well. And I think I realised that it was actually better for me as a person to be have something else. It made me more relaxed and enjoy my table tennis more because I wasn't under pressure to win all the time. Because it's a lot of, okay. it's a lot. I think I'm the sort of personality I am. I put a lot of pressure on myself and I'm a, quite a perfectionist. And for a professional player, a lot is riding on you to keep winning and win the matches. For some people, that's fine and they can live with that and they thrive off it or they just think it's normal. And for, for someone like me, I think it was better to have something to take my mind off the sport in, t- in times, good and bad. Even when I'm playing really well, you need something to keep me down to earth. And if I'm struggling, something to make me feel like there's more to life. Yeah, that, I mean, that that's actually really interesting, That whole the whole idea that if you've got something else, then there's not going to be quite as much pressure on you. You're not thinking, well, table tennis is all I've got. So if I'm losing at table tennis, then I've got nothing because it, it, you're just opening up the fact that table tennis is just part of your life and that there's there's so many different aspects to it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it does bring it with it a challenge because you've got to still practice on a on a high level and get in the hours. So you have to. I had to be very disciplined with studying times and like you know you still got to practice a lot putting all the work and at the same time study so it is a very difficult route to take but I still felt it was the best for me personally Mm. yeah that that would make your life more like what kind of the the lower level of player is experiencing someone that decides that they want to get really good or really want to boost their level and they're and they're training every day or twice a day potentially but at the same time they've got to work or they've got to study around it how how did you how were you able to manage the two was it just a case of you do table tennis in the morning and then you practice in the you you study in the afternoon like how how was your daily setup I I mean one of my strengths is planning and organization 
Um, so I think you would have to, what I did was sort of plan the whole year. So you look at, or you start off like that, planning the whole year. So you look at what you have that's important for table tennis, such as like a, a, a major competition, for example, like a world or even for whatever your major competition is, maybe it's nationals or even like the low county tournament at the end of the season, you know, and you say, yeah, yeah. you look at what are the, what are the important things to table tennis and what are the important things like assessments, exams, or, I mean, I don't know how flexible a job could be, but you might still have deadlines or periods where you, you're going to have to do a lot more work or you've got more, a lot more stress. So I would plan the year when I've got exams and stuff. Obviously, if I could choose tournaments not to to be on around the same time, but otherwise you've just got to find ways to deal with that. But in a perfect world, you sort of plan when you give more time to table tennis, when you give more time to studying. Really. Um, mm. So yeah, that's how I would do it. So I would I would have to be very disciplined at the start of the year with studying if I had less tournaments to get a lot of work done, so that later on. In, in the year or whenever a big tournament came, I was free to practice and not have that stress. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Well, ne- so now you're back to, to just table tennis. Are you 100% table tennis and, and that's your sole focus? Yeah, finally. Yeah, I've gone back. I, I felt it was worth... Cause my, so my final year of uni, I still played league, but didn't really practice on the high level, on an elite level. Like I still practice well, but I wasn't putting in the hours that you need really to perform on a high level. So, um, and I did that because I did. I wanted to make sure I got a good mark in my degree, and it was worth it. And then I've got sort of got that in the bag, and it's I can be relaxed about that. Um, so, yeah. And I think even though I'm not studying this year, so I've decided to go for table tennis. I feel because I've got that behind me, it's it makes me more relaxed about going for it for a year. Yeah. So yeah, and I mean. I think it's a, it's the only it's the time I could do it because I've not got committed to a job yet. It's all decided if I'm going to do further study. So it's just sort of now or never really. I've got to go for it and commit and get back to practicing on the high level and putting in the hours. And I'm enjoying it because I've got more time to relax, more time to analyze, more time to sort of unwind and see how things are going. And so I'm more fresh when I go into practice and I'm yeah. more motivated and like I've got a lot of time to prepare for big tournaments and sort of give commitment to that. So yeah, it is, it is a compromise. The fact that I studied, maybe I, it cost me a little bit, but I felt I felt it was right for me. But yeah, I'm, I am enjoying this year the fact that I can just solely focus on table tennis. Yeah, and you're at the the Werner Schlager Academy in Vienna, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. How's how's that going? You've been there before. Yeah, so I mean. Yeah, I've been here lots of. I've practiced here a lot for the last two. This is my third season, really. Um, it's almost like, almost like a second home for you over there. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I've got an Austrian girlfriend, um, <laughs> so okay, I feel very at home here, and that's nice. It's a it's a lovely city, <clears throat> so I can switch off well when I'm not practicing. But, I mean, the main reason was it's a high level practice environment, really. Since the national centre was closed in Sheffield. <clears throat> And even then, the better players here, you know, there's top players in the world. Just being around them is, is, is what I wanted to see. I wanted to know how they practice. And I practice with them sometimes as well, so you get to play them. And I think just it's built my confidence to play on that level. I'm not afraid of those players anymore, whereas before maybe I was. Yeah. So the goal is top 100. How? Give us your assessment. How's it going so far? How far through are you? Um when when's that kind of that point where you're gonna you're gonna say right this is the point where I want to be at top hundred and and see how close I can get? Well, I mean, <clears throat> since I finished my degree in May, so I I, I started slowly building up the practice. So I'm, I mean, it's difficult on this level or the level I'm trying to get to because you can't really predict when everything comes together. And mm. also, I'm working on. I'm not working on massive things, but I'm working on a lot of things to improve and a lot of them are small details. And it takes time for those to come into your game and it takes time for you to be able to use those things under pressure. Yeah, that's something that comes up episode after episode is <laughs> is how we all want things in practice to go into the matches straight away and how it just doesn't happen sometimes for months and months. Yeah, it's frustrating, yeah. 
So you said there's quite a few different little things that you're working on. Can you can you give us an idea of some of those things? Like what exactly are you trying to improve at the moment? Yeah, so I mean, I normally break it down into four areas. So you've got physically, psychologically, tactically and technically. Um, okay. <clears throat> so to start me off, I mean, physically, I felt top 100 players are a lot, very consistent and they have a lot of quality. And I felt to I needed to change my technique slightly to get more quality in my top spin and stuff. So I've tried to be deeper in my legs. So I've had to sort of work in the gym to be able to have more strength in my my lower back and um, glutes. And so this allows me to get in the half longs well, stay low and like have more quality longer in the rallies. Um, okay. And yeah, I mean, if you if you look at the top players, they all have a good, they stay very low and they use a lot of the sort of, leg leg and lower back power and that I think yeah. that's something that a lot of people miss um a lot of people stand too upright and that's something I've tried to work on so you think the standing upright is is actually due to not having the strength to stay down and stay in a good position well it's, it's probably a bit of both, both I mean if you've learned that technically then yeah it's obviously just the way you, you're used to playing but I think it's also a lot of the time yeah, it is to do with strength and I mean obviously if you're in a lower position more regularly you're naturally building that strength so Mm. but yeah I do yeah I think it's an easy way to get more quality in your top spins and things like that and to be more consistent is to have that work on your lower back and sort of uh, glutes and and leg leg power really so that you can stay low and be solid with your top spin yeah yeah, so I mean, psychologically, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the top 100 players, they, they have confidence in their ability. And I think to have confidence on that level is another step. So, for example, <clears throat> I have confidence at my level because I know my game is good enough to beat a lot of the people around me, and the, especially mm-hmm. the people that I would class as weaker than me, because that just naturally gives you confidence. But when you're trying to push on to the next level, you have to build confidence with that while you're developing things. And I think a lot of the confidence comes from practicing on a high level regularly. Um, so I'm just aware that I need to, every day, every time I practice, I've got to show up and have high focus, play with quality. And it's got to become normal that that new level, I've got to do it every day. And then that's how it sort of gets into your matches. And that's how you can do it under high pressure situations, really. Um, yeah. And I mean, one of the things I say to myself often is train hard on a high level. But then when you go into matches, try and just be relaxed and play freely. That seems to work for me as a person. So you sort of increase the pressure in practice and try to decrease the pressure on yourself when you go into matches. So then you sort of meet in the middle and they sort of yeah. get as close to each other as possible. Yeah, instead of, I guess, a lot of people do the opposite. They're quite chilled out in practice, but then once it gets to a match, then they get really tense. There's loads of pressure. It's Yeah, exactly. I think that's one of the ways people can really improve psychologically is is to try and get a closer connection between those two things. And the simplest way for me to describe it is like that, yeah. Try to take the pressure off the matches and try to increase the pressure in practice. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah, technically... Quite a few little things, but generally better touch, short touch. I've worked a lot on that. I think in the past I've touched with one technique, but if you're the top players, they use different different angles of the bats to get different spins depending on what's coming over. So they got more variation. Okay. <clears throat> and that that has a big impact. A lot of people think short touches, you know, with your bat wide open, sort of facing the ceiling, for example, yeah. for one touch. But sometimes. In uh, the Schlager Academy, you get coached to go around the side of the ball or use different spins depending on what's coming. Right. Just, so just as much variation on all shots as possible. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, to use the wrist and be flexible because that allows you to, <clears throat> one, it allows you to vary what the opponent, the types of balls they're receiving from you. But also it allows you to react to what they're doing and, you know, it gives you more options and things like that. Cool. The higher level I get to, the longer the rallies are. And I think it, it goes to the strength as well, but it also goes to the getting used to playing longer rallies and getting used to the ball coming back. And you've sometimes a shot that would have, would have won the point for me against somebody like 
200, 250 in the world isn't going to win the point for me against a 100 in the world. Yeah. So your general level, it, you've got to be more used to, to playing those high level points and longer points. Um, so that's a that's a that's also a psychological thing as well as a technical thing. Um, mm. Yeah, uh, and I've, I mean I've worked a lot on my serves as well, and similar to the short touch, having the variation to change it, trying to get my serves with high quality, but being able to vary it as well. Because I think when a when a good player gets used to your serve, they automatically relax. And, mm. and, and can just do what they want with the ball and then you lose control and as, as a general if you if a player is better than you and they they figure out your game or you've only got a couple of options they automatically relax and they're not stressed and I think keeping a player nervous or not sure what you're going to do can have a massive impact on their level yeah and it, that sort of so finally brings me on to tactically I mean yeah it's similar to that really being smarter varying things, not letting the player settle, um, is, is, is something I found is really important. And you'll find a lot of good, a lot of players are going on against a stronger player and the first set's quite close. And if they don't win the first set or if they don't keep the player nervous or not sure or on the, on the edge, then the other player can sort of relax and start to perform on a higher level and, and be too strong for the player. And I think those things are really important. So if you can if you can win the close points or keep the game tight, you have more chance of beating a player that is sort of better than you or on paper better than you or you would think is better than you. Mm. And how's this all going? Are you are you playing in you're playing in the Danish league? Yeah, so Are you seeing are you seeing the results mm. that you're hoping to see? Because I know you haven't played that much internationally, so you haven't really been been seeing the the ranking changes, but are you seeing your game improving? Can you see big big changes? Well, I mean, so I, from I sort of had a mini good improvement, like a, from May until August, I so I'd put in a lot of practice, and my first tournament of the season was um, Austrian Open, and I I had a decent win. I beat uh, Marco Jevtovic, who is 135 in the world. Right. So that was a pretty good start to the season. And Sam and I got to the quarterfinals of the doubles, which is the best I've ever done. So that was a good start. And then um, went to the Europeans and, and got ill. And yeah, you've got a bit of a sore throat even now, haven't you? Because you just had your tonsils out. Yeah, exactly. So I, my second international of the season was Europeans, but I only managed to play one match because I was ill with my tonsils. And so the last month, I've actually not been able to practice because I'd to rest and had my tonsils out. There's been a bit of a blow to the season. So I sort of spent three months getting myself back up to a level or working on these things. <clears throat> Got a little bit of a result and then had to, and I've had to go sort of back to square one and started practice again this week. So, uh, yeah. But so I'll have, to, I'll have to continue to work on these things and build up again. And I've so had to pull out of the Polish Open and the Swedish Open. So my, Next goal internationally will be after Christmas in January, probably the German Open. So it's, okay, so, so it's all building up to January now at the moment. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be getting good at learning how to get myself up to the next level because <laughs> it's my yeah. second go at it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it's it's a bit of a setback, but it's the good thing is I've got a lot of league matches that I'm flying to Denmark this weekend, so I'll be able to see where I'm at and what I need to work on. Um, yeah, it, it, I think that's a good thing is league, league's really important because you get high level matches and you're, you're able to see where you're at, but it's not quite internationally. So you're not putting yourself on the line in terms of world rankings. So mm. it's a, it's a really good up, level up in pressure, but not on the same level of pressure as when you're competing internationally. So yeah. hopefully a lot of these things that I've been trying to put into practice and, yeah, pay off. Yeah, and then in January we can see some some good results on the world tour and and try and get your ranking moving off again. Yeah, would be nice. Yes, <laughs> that'd be good. Now, um, something that doesn't get mentioned that often when we talk about professional table tennis is is kind of how good you need to be in order to to really make a go of it. In order to to have table tennis as your full career, not have to worry about anything else, and just to focus on that. And I know that you. 
you kind of said in that in that interview with Tableton it's England that you thought kind of top hundred was an important point that if you can get to top hundred then you're you're going to be okay but if you can't maybe you need to think about about doing other things and this has been something that's kind of been a bit of a, a thorn in the side of English table tennis for for quite a few years we've got a lot of players getting up to kind of top 300 top 200 and then having to kind of go into coaching or or maybe just leave table tennis altogether and go and get a job and and they haven't managed to really push through that level what, what are your thoughts on on all of that and and in terms of making table tennis a career yeah it's definitely a challenge for players because actually in England or in the UK, it's a better career to go into coaching because obviously Paul and Liam have done really well and they've hit a different level where you can you can make a good living from the sport and uh, get a good club, get a good sponsorship and it's sustainable. But yeah, I'm mean, roughly around 100. It, after that, it's very, it's challenging and you sort of, it's it's more about just getting by, being able to pay for your tournaments um, and just have enough to live off. Whereas I think coaching is actually on a different level. You can have a, a good career from it. Um, and you, you, as a player, you're putting yourself at risk because if you get injured or anything like that, you've got no security. And that's mm-hmm. another thing that I think makes players have to stop from it earlier than they would prefer to because there's no security there. There's no pension you know, it's you're basically um, putting yourself on the line with with no guarantee of anything, and there's nothing to fall back on. And I think that's something that yeah isn't isn't discussed enough. Um, and it's a shame because the generation before me, people like uh, Terry Young, basically Andrew Bagley, has has been a really has done amazingly well. You know, because he was the only one that survived into his late twenties and over thirty to, to have a, a good career in the sport. And yeah. It's a shame that there aren't we didn't have a all of his a lot of players from that generation come through because we had a big gap in the, the top senior players and it meant that we had to start again. And like if you go in terms of the competition we were talking about and the level of practice you need and you need a group to push each other. We mm-hmm. didn't we didn't have that because of that and that cost us a lot I think and that's why we dropped the level for quite a while. So, yeah, it is it is tough, and so I'm going to be 26 in December, and I'm feel like I've got to go for this year, and after that, you know, you got to make a decision about your career and if if, if it's um what what you want to do, and should you get a real job and things like that. Yeah, so I mean, I ideally you would continue playing table tennis and 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 keep doing that. Is that what you, if you could pick anything to do, that's what you'd want to do. Yeah, yeah, I love playing table tennis, um, but I also love psychology. But I feel I could I could combine the two. Um, but I, I think another challenge is we're not we don't we're not getting the support in terms of you know the areas I've pointed out physically, psychologically, tactically, technically. There's no support there. So because our funding's been cut, so you've got to get all of these things by yourself. So as a, yeah. as an athlete, I know that I'm not getting maximizing everything in the way that I could you know if you look at someone like Andy Murray he's able to like have a team around him who are looking after his what he's eating physically massaging you know if he's trained really hard he'll recover yep. as quickly as possible and I, I can do a lot of those things and that's what I try to do but there's no way you can do it to the same level if uh, and if you've got a proper team a professional team around you that are taking care of those things and maximizing so I know as an athlete that I'm not maximising all my areas. And that also makes me feel like I'm not able to give everything to the sport um, it, or com- reach my full potential or, you know, over the years of how I practice and stuff. And that's another re- feeling of, I don't want to feel like that. It's, 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 yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a frustrating feeling to think that if you'd had a better, we'd have full Olympic funding, for example, which I know it's a tough um system you know it's based on medals but if you don't have that support it's very difficult for athletes to to reach the high level the top level yeah, it's got to, it's got to feel i don't know it's hard to it's hard to explain but if you're trying to put everything into it and really sacrificing like what else you could be doing to really go for table tennis you don't feel like you've got the backing of 
people behind you like tournaments are self-funded now is that right yeah definitely yeah i mean don't get yeah, me- like that that just that just sounds like madness to me like that players are having to pay their own tournament entries and things yeah, but- it, i mean don't get me wrong table tennis england are doing a really good job all the changes they've made have been brilliant you know and they've changed the whole philosophy of everything and they they just don't have the money to support us so i'm not yeah it's it's not them it's the fact that there's no there's no money there to, to, to provide that so but yeah it is, it is very frustrating and uh, mm. it you, you just sort of feel like the, the it, it's tough when a, a funding decision is made on your results or you know your the potential to get medals at the olympics when actually to get those medals the people that have got medals there have had a performance package that has provided everything they need to get to that level yeah it's, like, it's the chicken and the egg isn't it yeah it is. so i understand why they make those decisions and they know money's tight you know like government money but it's as an athlete personally obviously it's very frustrating and you you for example i mean up until the commonwealth games in glasgow we had a full three months we had everything you know we had because they got money from sport england so we had a full package of physios um like we had two physios we had a physical program we had work cycle psych- on psychology we had tournaments you know we had training camp in china and just to feel what you have when you have that for those three months we all i mean we had the best commonwealth games we've, we've had i think we got five medals and it was just a brilliant experience to be part of that and you know it was brilliant to have that but at the same time you think oh we had that all the time yeah. it was, you'd, you'd be able to compete on a higher level as a country and produce more players and the players you've got would get to a high level so it's mm. yeah it's, so do you see yourself going into sports psychology at some point in the future even if it's 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 maybe five five years ten years down the line but do you think that's something that you'd like to do long term yeah it's definitely a possibility like at the moment because i think i've had 15 16 years in the sport i feel like that's why i did straight psychology was because I wanted to do something totally, well, I mean, it is connected, but totally separate in terms of what you study. Yeah. And uh, I want to go into sort of the neuroscience, possibly, and things like that. But I think it's, it's, it's definitely there to come back to. I feel like I've learned a lot, and I feel like, yeah, if you feel like you could help make a difference and things like that, I would, yeah, definitely. Great. And you've got options open to you, so... It's kind of the pressure's off, isn't it? You can you can do table tennis, and and now that you've got your degree, you can you can do all sorts of things with that as well. That's the that was the thinking, yeah. Um, yeah. It's a good feeling to get the degree, and I yeah, I think if we could encourage a lot of the young players to try and combine their academic studies with playing and support that, I think that's a really good way to go. Yeah, something I was gonna I was gonna say is that they they seem to be doing a really good job now at Nottingham Uni. Have you seen what they're what they're doing there with the table tennis training that Alex Perry's set up? Yeah, no, I think it's brilliant. That's the perfect situation, really, because you're tapping into the funding from a university, and university sport is really exploding, and it's a really good thing. They've got a lot of investment there, and uh, yeah, Alex Perry and Nicola are doing a great job. Um, and that's one thing I'm looking at is possibly doing a master's there. Okay. Because it's a good chance to combine the table tennis with studying as well. Um, and that's, that's definitely something really positive. And I think it's really encouraging for a lot of players in England that are doing the GCCs or A levels and are on a decent level. There's a possibility there to practice on a very high level and study at the same time with uh, a great uni. Yeah, it's important to give people the ability to combine the two and not have to pick one or the other. It seems like for too long, people have had to either sacrifice all their education to go abroad and play table tennis on a bit of a gamble or just kind of quit table tennis at 18 to go to university and, and not really think about it ever again. Yeah, it's a. I mean, you can understand why people make those decisions because they really want to reach a goal and they have a dream and but yeah, in a perfect world, you could you could do the both both together, and I think that's something that is table tennis England are definitely looking to support, and it's great that we've got universities like Nottingham that are supporting that as well. So it's a positive step for table tennis, and uh, yeah, it's good. Great. Well, we've reached the point in the interview where I ask for a top tip. I hope you've you've had a bit of time to think about something, Danny, but. 
could you share with us some piece of advice that you think would be really helpful for all of the listeners to go and apply to their game? So, yes, I, we mentioned it earlier, but I think putting yourself under pressure in practice is really important to try and get the level of pressure you have in practice similar to what you have when you compete in matches and in tournaments. And uh, one of the best examples of this was when I worked with a sports psychologist in Sheffield Hallam and working on my serves and she would get me to do 10 serves, high quality serves and sort of make a target on the table with a towel or something. And I've got to hit the area that I've set out and I would have to put myself under pressure, imagine that I'm in a high pressure situation and do 10 serves and see how many I get. And I think that was a really good way of seeing what level your serve is at under pressure and can you still get the same quality and accuracy. Um, and if you could do six, seven, eight, nine, or even 10 out of 10, it means that you're definitely on the way to being able to do that at 10 all in the fifth or when it's a really important serve. And it also builds your confidence in your ability to serve with high quality mm-hmm. under pressure. Like using the example of serving is really good there because that's often something that when people practice their serves, they're on a table on their own with a box of balls. There's absolutely no pressure. They're doing all these great serves. And then they just try and transition that where they're completely relaxed into, like you say, it's 10 all in a match. They're still trying to do that serve, but now they're, they've got pressure, they're tense, they're tired, and all of a sudden the serve isn't anywhere near as good as it was in practice. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, you see a lot of people serving um, and just looking totally bored or hating it. I know I've heard a lot of people say they they don't like doing service practice. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I mean, everybody's different, you know, like you got to find what's good for you. But I do think if you can learn to have the focus and create the intensity in service practice, sort of pay, play little mind games with yourself, serve for the final serve or something like that, it really is an advantage and you and it's it's all go, goes back to the top level players they have little routines as well and you can sort of start to develop a routine and all these things bring your serve level up to be a consistently high level yeah and i've seen photos as well of like the chinese squad when they're on one of their training camps and they'll they'll have like bits of paper on the table and they'll have the whole squad crowded around the table and obviously they're doing some kind of game where you have to go up and do a serve onto a certain piece of paper in front of everyone and everyone's going to see if you if you make it or if you miss so like that's just creating huge amounts of pressure so they're, they're basically doing exactly what you're what you're saying here yeah definitely yeah um and it's horrible to do it <laughs> like in a way nobody wants to be under that sort of pressure or you feel a bit uncomfortable but you, mm. you actually get used to it as well, the more you do it. Yeah, because somebody... you're going to be uncomfortable in the match, aren't you? So you might as well get used to it. Yeah, exactly. It's not really, pressure isn't always fun, but it's fun when you perform well under pressure and win after, or you feel good after. So it's it's a strange um, feeling or sort of place to be in, in your head. But uh, no, I think it's a really positive thing. I mean, to get your friend to stand there or get your bet to do 10 press-ups or something if you hit the serve or you know create create little games and i think it's a really good way of doing it yeah brilliant well thank you so much for for coming on the show danny it's been it's been great talking to you thanks ben now it's been great chatting um now you haven't got a website or anything have you i was i was doing a search no i haven't um you got you got you got twitter what's your what's your twitter name so it's at underscore danny reed all the at underscore danny reed yeah Okay, so so is that is that the best way for people to follow you and, and send you a message if they want to? Yes, definitely, yeah. I mentioned about all my tournaments and my matches, and uh, yeah, I tweet a lot about psychology, or retweet a lot about psychology, so uh, if anyone's interested in that as well. Cool, great. And yeah, we wish you all the um, the best of luck in January when you're, when you're back onto the, the international circuit. And I really hope that you're able to to see that big push and get yourself up into the into the top 100. That'd be brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I'm going to go for it and good luck with everything as well. Cheers. Yeah. All right. Cheers, bye. See you later. See ya. Bye. So a huge thank you goes out to Danny for joining me on this episode of the podcast. What really stood out to me from that episode was just the sheer quantity of practice that that Danny started doing as a 10-year-old. He was relatively new to the sport, but he just really jumped headfirst into training. 
And he said that very early on there was some kind of chat between um, his coach, Carol, and the family about you know, how much dedication and, and training would be required if he did want to become a good player. And then from then on, it seems like he was pretty much doing 20 hours a week right from the start. Um, me and Danny are, are basically the same age. I think he's six months younger than me. And we started at about the same time. But I know I spent the first two years playing just for a couple of hours every Saturday morning at the Leisure Centre with, with my coach, Mark Berman, who was on just a few episodes back. So whereas I was doing two hours a week, Danny was doing 20 hours a week from the start. And if you look at how our, our kind of results and rankings diverged from that point, you know, you, you see the effect of that. All those hours of really high quality practice paid dividends for, for Danny. And, and I just instead steadily improved over the years, but nothing like what he achieved. So I think he is a real success story for for the Matthew Saeed idea of getting yourself in in a strong club and and some of it's luck being in the right place at the right time but then alongside that he's also had to put in a huge amount of work over the years and that's something that that we can't really skip over 15 years of training near enough full time and he was really honest in the interview today sharing what that's actually like how you know, it's not easy. There's not a huge amount of money in it. And, you know, you've really got to be dedicated and pushing yourself. And, and I think we just in England don't have enough players that are putting in that amount of work. That's why we don't have, you know, a huge amount of, of really strong players. It's not that we don't have the, the talent or anything. It's just that, you know, in China, they have thousands of players working as hard as Danny, whereas in England, we've, we've only got a handful. And I think that's really what it comes down to. So so that's very encouraging because you can take away from that that even if you're you're a beginner, if you really go for it, you know, you start putting in some serious hours and, and training under some good coaches and, and around other decent players, you're going to see some results. You're going to get the rewards for all the hard work. I hope you enjoyed this interview. Um, as always, please subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Leave us a review if you've got a spare minute and um, and share the show on Facebook and Twitter as well. I'll be back in a week's time. My guest is going to be Brett Clark, the online coach from TT Edge. And that's going to be a slightly different interview, but really great because we're going to be able to talk about loads of different practical tips that he has. Um, he's coached so many players, both in person and and online via the TT Edge system. So he's just got a wealth of knowledge that he's going to be able to share with you. I'm really looking forward to hearing his advice and hopefully giving you loads of new things to think about and ways to improve your game. Thanks for listening. I will see you in a week's time with episode number 26 coming out next Friday. <laughs>